Cool. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You got me. Great. Um, well, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Elliot, and the first thing to say is thank you so much to Holly and Kieran for letting me talk to you about water bowls today. Um, yeah. So uh, it's a really inspiring project that I hope will uh, not only teach you about water bowls but also show you what a community can achieve when they put their mind to it and get together. <clears throat> so just quickly before I begin, so my name's Elliot. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, myself and a friend, we set up a uh, small conservation organization called Citizen Zoo, uh, which is all about um, inspiring local communities to engage with <clears throat> proactive conservation measures. And uh, we utilize a, a rewilding narrative. I'm still very much involved with Citizen Zoo and that's how this project began. We, we, we set it off, I'll, I'll tell you more about that. In a, in a moment but now uh, I have um, uh, a new job which is I work for Kingston uh, Borough Council which is in southwest London and I'm their biodiversity officer which is their um, which is a new position that's quite exciting and uh, is trying to put together a biodiversity action plan for the borough and um, yeah uh, still getting my uh, teeth sort of in, dug into that been based on COVID duties quite a lot recently, as I'm sure many of you can imagine. Um, but yes, today I'm here to talk to you uh, about water bowls. Um, I was sort of hoping if I could see some of the, 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 the hands in the screen, but I think what we will do, we'll do questions at the end, but I might just ask sort of questions that you can put hands up to throughout, just so we can get an idea. So for example, if I said, who on this call has ever seen a water bowl before? And if they could use a little hands up function, and then, I don't know, there was some way of counting that. It'd just be interesting to know how many people have actually seen a water bowl in the wild. Um, and cool. Um, and I'll go to the next screen. Okay, so the first thing to know about a uh, water bowl, I think, if you're gonna make one thing from this, uh, this uh, school um, little lecture, is that uh, Kenneth Graham, Wind in the Willows, the much loved uh, book and I think my personal favourite adaptation is the Monty Python's version but Ratty is indeed not a rat he is a water bowl and I think that it just is uh, that just shows you how um, uh, endearing and how part of British culture the water bowl actually is as a special place I think uh, in British sort of society I think many people absolutely love them I think it gives a hedgehog a good a good race for one of our favourite mammals so they really are a much loved creature um, and yeah, but I think many people, when it comes down to it, they probably don't know too much about water voles and they probably don't know that they are the UK's fastest declining mammal and, and the reasons behind that. But to give you a bit of background, um, one thing to say is they are indeed a rodent. Um, <clears throat> uh, they're in the, they're in the sub in a subfamily with, the, with all the voles, lemmings and, and muskrats. And across the UK of the British Isles, we've got four vole species. We've got the short-tailed vole or field vole, we've got the bank vole, obviously got the water vole and we've also got the Orkney vole. Uh, when the Orkney vole is quite an interesting vole, I think it's found on eight of the different islands within the Orkney sort of region and uh, I think Neolithic man took field vole over to the Orkney Isles, um, where, where, I don't know if it was a pet or, was a, uh, or it might have just stowed away on some boats or something but then because it was rep reproductive isolation we then became sort of a separate species. Um, so yeah, going off on a tangent there, but yes, yeah, so we've got four voles. Um, back to the water voles. In terms of water vole species, <clears throat> there are two recognised species of water vole. Um, the one that we have is the northern water vole, and that's distributed from across Britain, across Europe, all the way to sort of Russia. And then the other uh, water vole species is the southern water vole, which is pretty much only found in Italy. If you look at their sort of ecologically evolutionary sort of history the reason I've got a mammoth on there they're not related to mammoths but they have been around for about 28,000 well they've got at least they've got a recorded history of 28,000 years so they've got a long long um sort of sort of history I imagine it goes back further than that but that's how that's how long our sort of records go back to in terms of fossil record and stuff and quite interestingly, interestingly, in terms of the UK population though we've all got the same the the, the all got the northern water vole species we have got some genetic variation within the two sort of main populations. So if you look at the sort of English population, um, that is quite different genetically to this, the Scottish population. And we think that's resulting from two different uh, colonization events that happened as the, the glaciers were receiving our, uh, receding after the last ice age. So they've got, um, yeah, they've got quite an interesting genetic lineage. 
Um, so a little bit more about the water vole. Um, as I said, they are our biggest uh, vole that we have in, in, in the British Isles, and that has important ecological implications that I'll talk about in a second. But um, they, they typically range between 140 grams up to about 350 grams for a big male. Females are typically uh, slightly uh, smaller. Uh, the females are slightly smaller. Um, and they have the longest tail of any, of any vole. Uh, they sort of use it as they swim along as a, a sort of a rudder. So that's a, that's a third length of the body is the sort of length of, of, of the tail. But I think they are quite, a, they are an endearing, charismatic creature. You just look at the picture there um, with its chubby sort of cheeks and its blunt nose. It really gives it that sort of cute sort of appearance. And you can also see it's actually got quite a lot of protein mixed on. It's quite a bulky sort of looking creature. And it's got its beady black eyes in the front of the head. And like any sort of typical prey species, it's got them its eye placement there, so it's always sit, sitting on, on on the banks, alert for potential predation, to, and not to get eaten. Um, like like all rodents, it has uh, open rooted teeth, which means the teeth are continually growing. Um, we're, uh, so they have to always nibble on the stuff to sort of keep their teeth from grow, from from getting too long and growing into their brain. Um, they can live for about three years, but that is absolutely exceptional. Typical um, uh, vole sort of lifespan in the wild is about, well, if you're lucky, two years, really. And they have high levels of mortality um, in, in, in the winter time. It's got about 70% mortality in, in, in the winter. And then they boom in the, in the summer. Um, and then, yeah, they, as I say, by booming in the summer, they have a very fucon species. So they really are very good at uh, having babies like most rodents are. Um, so one female can uh, have eight litters in one, in one season uh, and uh, they can um, have up to five uh, baby of sort of kits per, per litter. Um, so where do they live? Water voles, we therefore typically associate water with them with our riverine systems, our rivers and our streams. Um, and they typically can be found within a three meter sort of distance from from these watercourses uh, when we look at sort of historical sort of textbook notions of uh, water bowl populations. Um, is the, the bank substrate is quite important. Obviously, they can't live where concrete banks are and stuff. They need sort of nice um, uh, sort of uh, muddy banks where they can they can dig into with lots of vegetation, lots of sort of riparian vegetation for them to sort of feed upon. Um, but they have also been known to climb trees. I was talking to somebody who was carrying out a water bowl survey not too long ago, and he was walking along the water course, looking in the stream for the water bowls. And he just looked up at this hawthorn tree, and apparently there was three or four water bowls just beaming down at him as he was uh, looking along. So they can, they can be quite good climbers, which many people don't really recognize. Uh, and they, they, they can also make nests above the ground when, um, if it, especially if it's a really sort of in our wetland environments where they can be found. And um, the home range, it does, it does, it does, it does, it does vary. Um, the, the home ranges are typically based linearly because they're found along the linear sort of uh, riverine sort of rivers and streams. Um, it ranges from 30 to 300 meters really. Males have a bigger home range than a female, um, and, but the, the females can be quite territorial, especially when they're breeding. But otherwise they do live in sort of big sort of social groups almost. Um, so uh, where, where, where else can they be found? So they, they are also found, uh, we, have, we have some recorded coastal populations, um, <clears throat> But there's quite a lot of evidence. If you look especially at continental European water voles, um, and also some of the populations that are in Glasgow, they're very much, they can be seen as a fossorial species. So almost like moles almost. So they can dig underground in the sort of wet, uh, sort of wet, wet meadowy type areas. And they can create these large burrow structures um, underground. And they, they can create sort of molehill type things as well. So maybe they are fossorial, um, they, they, they can be wild, wild, well adapted to being a fossorial species, not just a riverine mammal. Um, and yeah, if we actually look at the evolution, the evolutionary features that um, they possess, uh, they're not very well adapted to living in uh, water. Uh, if you look at like an otter or a beaver, otters and beavers have webbed feet and they've got really um, uh, waterproof coats, um, whereas 
Water voles haven't got any of that really. The only sort of really decent ad adaptation they've got is that long tail that I mentioned, which they use as a rudder. But if they're underwater for too long periods, their coats become waterlogged, they can't hold their breath very long. As I say, they've got a little feet that don't work very well as paddles. So when you see them swimming, they sort of doggy paddle along the surface, and it looks like they're putting a lot of effort into it and not getting very far. Um, so maybe that's because they have more of a fossorial sort of evolutionary background and they've been pushed out to the rivers because, because in the sort of 12th century, when we brought rabbits across uh, to the UK, perhaps these rabbits might have pushed them out of their sort of typical ecological niche, and now we see them in less preferable habitat potentially. Um, but yeah, so it's quite an interesting thing. Um, so that because if you if you look at the sort of physiology and stuff, rabbits and um, waterfalls could potentially hold uh, hold very similar niches, ecological niches. They are very adaptable in terms of their uh, dietary preferences. Um, they can eat about, as we recorded, that they can eat about 227 different species of plant, and that's all sorts of stuff. They've got particular favourites in willow herb and loose strife, meadow sweet, water crow's foot, and stuff like that. Especially when a female is pregnant, she wants to have quite a protein rich diet, so then she'll be having flowering plants, even things like dandelions and uh, Sometimes they've all been known to uh, predate or eat um, on uh, dead fish to boost their protein, boost their sort of protein levels, especially during their sort of pregnancy stages. And they do have to continually eat, not just to keep their teeth uh, at a reasonable level, but also because um, they have to eat about 80% of their body weight every day. And if you look at their typical uh, sort of behaviour, they spend about four hours on the river and then they'll spend four hours in the burrow going back and forth. But even when they're in the burrow, they're still being busy. They've got areas in which they cache food and they've got their chambers where they have their young. So these burrows are really quite complex um, sort of engineering structures. And that's what brings me to my next point in terms of their evolution, their sort of uh, ecological uh, function, uh, what, what, where they sort of fit in the food system or in, in, our, uh, in our ecological uh, systems. And, and the most important thing, as I said, because they are such a big vole, uh, they're like sort of three times the size of a sort of bank vole almost in terms of weight, some, um, if you get a big one. So that means if a heron or something like that is trying to predate upon uh, something, it would have to eat lots of bank voles or it could just have one water vole. So therefore it does find it, it really does hold up our sort of food, our, our food webs and make our sort of ecosystems more energy rich and being able to support more sort of creatures in terms of our apex predators and just have a more biodiverse area. And one interesting thing why I've written plop there um, is because, because they are such, uh, they're pretty much, a sandwich on legs to many things. So they are very, very, very uh, uh, sort of skittish creatures. They're always alert. That's why they're sitting on the banks with their eyes up above their head, always alert for um, a potential um, species that might come and eat them, which could be a fox or a kestrel or a heron or even a cat, especially in urban environments. So what they do, as soon as they feel under threat, they will jump into the river or, or do their, try and jump in the river and they create a bigger splash or plop as they can and that plop is not only that not only their way of trying to escape and swim away but it also the, the biggest splash they make is that sort of alarm call they make to the other surrounding water bowls that might be in the area so once you hear one plop listen out to other plops and that might be all these water bowls throwing themselves into the water course to try and save themselves and if you ever hear it i do think it is i almost can compare it to like hearing a wolf or hearing you know a really or, or hearing our dawn chorus i think it really is one of these sounds that defines a healthy working ecosystem. Um, they also create habitat, so by creating these complex and intricate sort of bur uh, bur burrows, that, provide, that in itself will provide habitat for things like grass snake, which will be sort of rest in there and then come out uh, and swim, because obviously grass snakes are very heavily associated with our uh, river, uh, our water uh, systems. And because they are eating lots of uh, vegetation, they are of course a very important seed disperser and uh, I think probably one of the most important things there, they are an absolute joy to see. Those of you who put your hand up um, just earlier, I'm sure can testify to that, or even here, just being able to hear it, I think it's just an absolute joy and just shows you that we have a nice functioning ecosystem that can support a range of species. Um, when, you, when you're ever working with any sort of uh, species, it's very important that you understand the laws that are associated with, uh, with, with with the species that you're obviously working with. Um, and water voles uh, in 2008, April 2008, 
who are giving legal protection under the, under underneath our Wildlife and Countryside Act. They're not a Europe, European protected species because they are found across Europe, but here where they are so rare, uh, they are they do uh, they are afforded with that uh, protection. Section nine under Schedule Five is where you'll find it. And as with so many other species that are protected under that sort of legislation, it's illegal to intentionally kill, injure, or take wild water voles. It's illegal to possess uh, wild water voles or intentionally, intentionally or recklessly. Um, damage their uh, their areas in which they, they shelter, um, and penalties can range up to about five thousand uh, pounds or a sentence of six months potentially. Um, but one thing that's very important to recognise with that all the, the the important word there is wild, wild, wild. So it, these these legal these laws don't apply to captive bred water voles. So whenever you're doing a reintroduction with captive based population, um, you don't need a natural England permit like something you would need for a beaver reintroduction or something like that. So uh, it, there are in a way that does make it relatively easy when it comes to considering um, the legal the, the the legal bureaucracy that comes around reintroducing them. Um, but as I mentioned at the start, unfortunately, they have the uh, sad title of the UK's fastest declining wild mammal. Um, a very important study done by a chap called Rob Strachan, who was uh, very much the uh, a keystone figure within uh, water vole conservation, um, uh, did a longitudinal sort of study uh, over the periods of 1989 to 1998, and he was just visiting different areas which had water voles and then saw that decline. And he reported a 94% loss within that period. Recently, the Wildlife Trusts have done uh, quite a lot of study uh, on, on the species, and a, recent, or a relatively recent report said even since that period, we've lost a further 30% of our water voles. So they are very much a struggling creature when it comes to our, um, our, 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 main, our mammals that are, are, are at the moment. For example, otters are doing quite well, water voles are still in um, pretty, a dire, pretty dire situation. The main reasons about that are obviously with any sort of decline of any species, there's a multifactorial reasons, lots of reasons that are going up to that decline, but mainly uh, habitat loss is one, the sort of losing the, the good quality features of our sort of um, river systems uh, and that degradation. But most importantly is the arrival of these chaps here, which is the American mink, which were brought over particularly in the sort of 80s for the, to supply the fur trade to create coats out of them and well-intentioned i imagine uh wildlife activists released a lot uh released them from these fur farms and uh because um things like our ground nesting water birds and uh um, uh, our, our water voles have no evolutionary adaptations to protect themselves against these new creatures uh, they get absolutely devastated by their presence uh mink are quite a lot smaller than otters so they will be able they can just uh uh, these mink can just get into the, the burrows of water voles, whereas an otter typically can't. So therefore, uh, one mink can um, um, pretty much eradicate an entire water vole population pretty quickly. And they're also a very mobile species, these mink, whereas a water vole is only going to move max about 300 metres. These guys can travel up to about 25 kilometres in a day. So they are a very sort of mobile species, posing a real threat to water vole con conservation um, and a lot of other species as well due to their sort of voracious nature as predators. Um, so things you have to definitely bear in mind when you're considering reintroducing them. So that's enough about background context. Hopefully you found that interesting if you didn't know much about water voles. But now I'm going to talk slightly more about the project that we're working on, which is bring the community together to try and bring back um, uh, water voles to our, to our area. And what we're basing this is on is in uh, Kingston in southwest London and, uh, and also into Epsom and Newell on the River Hogs Mill. Um, uh, hopefully on our call we've got lots of people who are aware of the Hogsmeade because I know lots of our great volunteers are on this call. So but again it'd be interesting to know of your hands who's, who's heard of the Hogsmill, um, just to get an, an idea of how many people know the river that we're talking about. Um, but it is an absolutely beautiful river. It is one of our 200 chalk chalk streams that you can find across the world. Um, it rises in Epsom Manual, which is in Surrey, and flows about 9.9 .9 kilometres through uh, Epsom Manual into Kingston, through the heart of Kingston, providing a fantastic wildlife corridor, and then meets the confluence, uh, as a confluence of the Thames in sort of Kingston town centre. It actually goes under a bridge called the Clatton Bridge, which is the oldest working bridge in, in London. But it is a fantastic, it's a fantastic river. Where a lot of, there's so many great organisations that work, and volunteers that work along its catchment. Um, 
And what we did last year, we actually made a film about it. So I think kindly, and if you check in the, lit, in the chat section, a link has been shared to a video that we made about this uh, river last year, filmed by a fantastic guy who does all sorts of um, documentaries like Blue Planet and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, he's a wildlife cameraman and he helped uh, film this nice little video of the hogs mill. And yeah, please do check it out. It was in the running to, to uh, win the charity film awards this year. But unfortunately we all made the finals, but didn't get to make the final cut. But um, yeah, great film. So if you have, you have 10 minutes, please do watch it because it is, it'll hopefully give you an idea of where we're, the sort of location which we're working on. But locally, King, uh, water bowls have a very um, significant uh, uh, sort of social history. Um, if you just go back 30 years, so many of the volunteers um, that are on our project and even myself, um, uh, well, if you go back 30 years, there was a time where water bowls were in good, good, good numbers on our river. Um, as I say, volunteers remember to going up to bridges along the catchment and throwing bread to swarms of water bowls with their children. But, um, uh, and then if you go back even further to about 1851, 1852, um, that is when Millet, the pre-Raphaelite painter, painted this picture, Ophelia, and the background of it is based on the hogs mill. So he spent about two years, well, was, the painting took about two years to do. Um, but yeah, it's apparently it's the most uh, sold postcard in, in, the, in, in the tape, which is quite an interesting fact. But yeah, we have this, uh, it, is, it features our river, which is something we should be very sort of proud about. But where the water bowls come into this, when Millet was painting this painting, he actually, in the original copy, he included a water bowl um, in, 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 in the canvas. And uh, then he took it to his pre-Raphaelite friends and said, look at this amazing picture that I'm working on. Can I get your thoughts? And they said, we love it. What we don't love is the rat. And he was like, oh, it's not a rat. I promise you it's a water bowl. But anyway, he lost that argument. So he had to remove the water bowl from, the paint, from, from, from this famous painting. However, if you do take it out of the canvas, I've been reliably informed, uh, you take out, take out the frame, I mean, and look at the edge of the canvas, you can still see Millet's sketches of water bowls. Um, so again, a really nice historic um, um, uh, uh, sort of part to play that they have on the river. Um, I suppose one thing I could mention, well, if you have questions later, I can say the key differences between a rat and a water bowl, um, just so we avoid confusion. And we could, I wish I was there in that discussion with his pre-Raphaelite friends. But if we look at distribution, Giggle, who are the lo local record centres for London, have been a fantastic um, help with this project. They've helped supply our data. So if you look, this is the, all the data that they've got um, in our surrounding area for uh, water bowls. And all those yellow dots that you can see there are nice, happy water bowls. And the red ones are the not so slightly scary mink. And then if we look to the most recent data, we can see uh, 20, well, 2014 was the last record of water bowls on our catchment and you can see there is a lot fewer yellow dots on that map which is just representative of pretty much the global the sort of national scene when it comes to water bowls but um, the last official record that we had on our catchment we believe to be 2014 and yeah so they, we, they are definitely now deemed to be functionally extinct throughout our catchment but this is not long ago right 2014 not that long ago. So this is, we're trying to address an extinction event that happened very recently. So it's not like we're trying to bring back mammoths or anything like that. So this is where our project was born. Get involved. Um, I love the logo. Our lovely uh, person, uh, uh, Citizen Zoo, we're a graphic designer who put this together. I absolutely love it. And um, yeah, so that is, this, that is a project was born to try and address that situation. So we actually launched this project pretty much a year ago to the day almost. So what we did, we rented out a big theatre in uh, Kingston and we put an event called Wild Kingston and this theatre had 800 capacity and we managed to fill out the whole place. It was absolutely amazing and these are all local people who have come to hear about local wildlife and just shows you at the moment the interest that there is in local conservation. So to me a really positive story and with lockdown I think that has even been even more um, uh, magnified by people having a closer affinity and connection to nature as we've explored exploring our local green spaces probably more uh, maybe discovering places that they even even knew existed. So I think it now is a really great time to empower and mobilize and engage with as many sort of local people as possible uh, and give them the uh, opportunity to really help contribute to our environmental health we have locally. And that is very much the principle that Citizen Zoo uh, works on. 
So we also enlisted the help of this chap. I imagine he's recognisable to some of you. He's called Derek Gow. To me, he's one of the most pioneering conservationists that the UK uh, has at the moment. He's involved in all sorts of species reintroductions, from wildcats to beavers. But he is a chap who pretty much um, defined and sort of wrote the book on how you do a modern day water vole conservation. He has a massive farming centre, uh, breed uh, centre in Devon, where he breeds um, water voles for releases across the UK. And uh, he has helped be an advisor on this project. And this is a person where we will actually source our water voles from when the, when the time comes. Um, one, of his, one of the facts I like about this guy, he, uh, throughout his uh, career so far, has bred over 25,000 water voles. So he's like, that is a lot of water voles responsible for one sort of operation there. So an amazing, contrib co uh, amazing contribution to our conservation sector. And yeah, we're, we're, we're very happy to, very, well, very well, privileged almost to have him as a sort of an advisor on this project. Um, which is great. We're also just about to start working with him on a project about glowworms, which is quite exciting as well, which, um, yeah, it's another topic completely. But this is him. This is when we could stand close together uh, uh, last year. Um, and we got him down to the, to the river and he had a look around. And actually he was saying he was surprised about the quality of the habitat. There were a lot of areas that he identified that were already appropriate to reintroduce water bowls to in terms of uh, the, the sort of vegetation presence and the quality of the banks. So that was an initial first sort of thumbs up that we got a year ago. Um, but obviously we needed more than that. We wanted to extensively survey uh, the catchment, which I'll come back to in a second. Also over the past um, year or so, we've done lots and lots of community engagement. So following that big wild Kingston event, we've done lots of school talks and community talks and, uh, uh, and community festivals. This is all last summer when we could do those sort of things. We even reported the project at the London Natural History Museum, which was something um, that Kieran and Holly were very much involved with, which was great. And uh, to date, we've owned, this project has engaged over 4,000 people, um, which is uh, uh, amazing. And by having that community engagement, that then empowered us and gave us the opportunity to try and recruit some really amazing volunteers who um, were able to support the project. So when we were talking to Derek Gow at the start of the project, we were said, where else have they done a community-led water bowl reintroduction? And this is said the only one that he was aware of. So this is in the South Downs National Park on another stream called the Meon, another chalk stream, I should say. And uh, this is the lovely Elena who ran, who ran that project. And I went down there last, well, over yeah, about a year ago to go and see how they delivered a community-led reintroduction project. And what was amazing, when I was standing with Elena on that bridge in that village, I looked down into that green vegetation and there were three water bowls sitting in there, which was absolutely great, just to show you that the community can really do some fantastic stuff when it brings back, um, um, or just bring to do some really proactive conservation work. And uh, so I had lots of questions for Elena. Because what I wanted to do, I wanted to use the sort of technology that, uh, or the, the methodology, I should say, that Rob Strachan uh, sort of defined in terms of how you survey uh, water vol habitat quality. And it's all in this great book here. Um, it, I recommend people get that book um, because it's really good. Um, but if you want to learn about water voles. Um, but I was, I was trying to modify his quite complex way of uh, surveying habitat for water voles uh, in a robust way. And I was trying to talk to Elena, how do we make this sort of more friendly when it comes to uh, water bowls? And she said, Elliot, um, that's fine. But what I would suggest what we did, all we did was ask eight questions. Um, and each question applies to left and right side of the bank. And that will give you a good indices, whether it's unsuitable, suboptimal or optimal um, uh, water, uh, sort of habitat for water bowls. So that's what we did. We then, uh, we, with some funding that we received from Chessington World of Adventures, which is based in Kingston, we were managed to uh, recruit an intern who will talk to you very briefly uh, a bit later, uh, called Brianna, and we enlisted the support of 60 amazing volunteers. We trained them at a Thames Water site, and then over the course of September last year, we got them all out on the river doing these surveys. So what we did, we, put, we split the, uh, the catchment into 100 metre sections, and utilize those eight questions to give a value to, uh, on, on the habitat quality. And this is what we came up with, again, with the help of Giggle, and, we, we, and uh, Rihanna did a lot of work on this. Um, but all our volunteers submitted our, our data, and we were able to get a good picture, a good overview of where suitable uh, uh, and unsuitable habitat quality was for water voles. Um, and as you can see, there's lots of green on that map. Uh, so there are lots of potential areas which are already in uh, an area space which which could support water voles, which was a nice surprise. And a lot of them 
uh, in quite uh, areas which um, uh, are quite there's quite a lot of connectivity between them. Um, so uh, yeah, a really great exercise, and it just shows you what you can do with a volunteer workforce. We just it were people, it was amazing. So to get that sort of resolution of data over that sort of wide sort of area in such a short space of time just shows you how powerful and how amazing a community can be when they're given the, the power to be so. It also engendered quite a lot of um, uh, publicity. So even did a little report on Sky News, which covered the project, which was really cool. And I think even more important than the water valves of this project have been the community. They've been absolutely amazing just seeing them, people remembering a time where water voles used to thrive on the river and, and feel like they can be part of the solution to bring them back. And we'd be, we, we, before we, um, we were in lockdown, we would even have like water bowl reading groups where people would talk about, uh, we had one, one water bowl reading group where people would talk about um, what, why, they, why they like water bowls literature, where, where they show up and, and the sort of memories that they had. So it really has struck a nerve and struck a sort of excitement, uh, electricity throughout the community, which has been absolutely amazing. So we're now in the next sort of phase of the project, because obviously mink are one of the biggest problems when it comes to water bowls. So what we've done, we've built 10 of these mammal rafts and we've deployed them across the catchment about kilometer intervals and they have a clay pad on the base and if anything walks over it will leave a footprint and then we can try and distinguish the quite identifiable print that a mink has and we've been doing this uh, from the start of this year even during the lockdown volunteers on their daily walk um, were able to go out and check these traps so even throughout um, a very difficult time to carry out conservation work uh, our stoic volunteers have been going out and still checking these traps where they where they could do so and still following all sort of social distance stuff. So yeah, it was great to get them on the river. Um, to date, we haven't recorded any prints of a uh, water bowl of of, um, of mink, but yes, well, a few days ago we did hear about a potential sighting. Um, so uh, we are looking at ways in which we can try and uh, address the issue of mink. We are looking at all sorts of options. Um, both um, typical way in which you trap and, and uh, dispatch, and also if we can find potential areas where they have received captive populations of, water, uh, of mink, which is apparently there are places across the UK in which you can actually send mink off in captivity uh, to try and avoid actually killing them, because obviously it's not the mink's fault being here. But we're, we're, we're identifying all the options that are available to us, and hopefully, well, we'll definitely have a way in which they'll be off the catchment, not, not, not causing any issues for our water bottles. Um, but again, going back to our community, we've got so many groups. So prior to lockdown, we would meet in Kingston University on a regular basis, and we would uh, we set up into different working groups. Um, so we had a working group which was about community engagement, one about fundraising, one about habitat restoration, and it's really great to see everybody get involved and really do um, sort of plan the, the, the reintroduction moving forward. As we moved into lockdown, um, uh, we've, we've as 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 the FFC have done, we've gone to a more uh, virtual world but we're still continuing to meet online regularly and we're still progressing the project as much as we can and this brings me to my next sort of uh, uh, bit which was, um, I've got two great volunteers uh, uh, hopefully Bill and Rihanna and they're going to just say a quick one minute or two minutes on why, they, why, why they've enjoyed the project so far Rihanna or Rihanna are you there to start you might be on mute Rihanna Okay, um, are you ready for me to Yeah, begin? go for it. Yeah. Great. Um, so I was um, recruited as the, uh, the water bowl intern. Um, so I was lucky enough to meet Elliot on a volunteering project and then find out about the project that way. So it was a really great foot in the door. Um, and um, so from the internship i really felt like i gained a lot of valuable skills that could be used further in the conservation sector that um, are widely used in different roles um, so the main one i'd say would be volunteer management um, so we had a great group of 60 volunteers as elliot mentioned um, and um, that involved us um, at the training day training them on how to um, carry out the survey so that really improved um, my presentation skills like making a presentation um, sort of in layman terms because at university I've been used to doing presentations using a lot of scientific language and it was nice to be able to speak in <laughs> a language that's more simple for everyone and um, being able to answer questions um, so 
so yeah it was really good to engage with them and uh, we had um, uh, um, a practice survey and just to get to know the volunteers and answer their questions and, great well thanks um, Diana. that was, that was yeah. awesome yeah was amazing yeah so and, and hopefully that will give you move uh, sort of yeah learning points moving forward as you go as you explore your conservation career and we've got bill on the kill yeah. well. hello there Hi. <laughs> hello um yeah well i was going to start this off by saying what uh, the kind of things i've been involved with in on the hogs mill but um uh more importantly i think um for those people who don't know a great deal about the hogs mill when i was running through these things i thought my word, um, there is a hell of a lot of stuff going on uh, on this urban stream. Um, I first met Elliot uh, six years ago when we were doing river improvements and uh, hammering in uh, uh, posts uh, for in-stream in improvements. Um, the work that's been done over the six years that I've been involved is with lots of different groups um the uh with um zsl there's been uh, the eel monitoring um initiative down at uh, the kingston university at uh, middle mill um i've been involved with other groups uh, based at, at the uni uh we've got going six years ago the river monitoring uh, scheme aligned to the national river fly scheme and uh, I started a new, uh, a new site on a tributary where Elliot had been instrumental in mobilising the local community and looking after a forgotten reserve. And that's now well established with its own, um, with everything well in hand, with its own organisation to do that. With uh, London Wildlife Trust, there's been dragonfly and damselfly surveys. Uh, we've had um, back in six years ago, about uh, a survey of the whole catchment for the uh, polluting outfalls. Uh, and then there's been monitoring of those um, ever since. And then, of course, there's the, the normal kind of thing of removing uh, Himalayan balsam, litter picks, taking rubbish large and small out of the river. So there's all that going on. And I thought, well, over the six years, I've picked up uh, quite a lot of uh, knowledge here and uh, I'd be useful to the project. But for me, it's more important really to, um, well, it's very important to talk to the new people coming to the river for the first time and to impart that, that knowledge to them. Uh, in addition, um, with South East Rivers Trust, we have people, um, they have a scheme called the River Guardian Scheme. Uh, where people in, are encouraged to go out and pick litter, uh, check out for pollution, uh, taking out um, Himalayan balsam on their own. And it's all about having a presence on the river. Um, so, community involvement is the most important part, one of the most important parts of involved. It's the community's river. Um, and more and more, I believe people should take ownership of their environment um, on their doorstep, right down to picking up a litter, uh, hands on. And uh, then with more knowledge about the problems and uh, uh, we can, there can then be some more pressure on, on, uh, on, uh, on the politicians, local and uh, national. Um, we can talk, they can talk with more authority with uh, the local authorities, water companies. Uh, it's about getting what we want from our rivers. Uh, at the end of the day, I want a river and its surrounds that can support and accommodate a thriving vol population. population. A community that works towards a river that can do that and even more importantly, keep it that way. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Ron. That was great. So that gives you a flavour of just the amazing sort of volunteer input and what, you know, we can achieve on, on, on the river. So thanks, guys. I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, so as you say, community engagement has 
changed a little bit while we've been on lockdown. So we're trying to uh, ramp it up a little bit. So there's all sorts of things that we're doing. We're just about to launch these water bowl little face mark, face coverings that you can wear uh, to try and raise the profile and a little bit of funds for the project. So if anybody wants to have one of these, please do, because uh, we, can, we can get them on our citizens on the Citizen Zoo website. But it's a great way to sort of raise awareness of the project and also um, help us get some money to try and buy our water bowls. And one of our volunteers, Margaret, has been creating all these amazing videos using sort of finger puppets and children friendly sort of videos in which we can continue to engage with, with people on, on, on lockdown. So um, our future plans um, in terms of obviously we haven't released any water bowls back to the population, back to the river just yet. So uh, in, in terms of, sort of what we're looking to do, we are awaiting um, for a sort of a large scale weir to be removed, um, which should be done very soon. It was slightly delayed over due to COVID situation, um, but we're hoping that will be uh, sorted in the relatively near uh, future. And then once that is done, we've got lots of habitat. We've got at least about four kilometres of contiguous habitat where we can release uh, water bowls. But even though the habitat is good and uh, we can all make, make it make it better in places, so working with people like Bill said, like the South East Rivers Trust and all sorts of organisations across the borough, we're going to do con con continual habitat restoration and, of course, management of that making sure that the, the habitat remains, it remains in, in good condition. As I mentioned, we're going to continue our um, have mink rafts, which are uh, installed along the river, and keep that, and that, that will happen long into the future. So we, as long as there's a water bowl presence, or even up to that point, far into the future, we'll always need to monitor the presence of mink, because we always have to be alert, because if they just show up one day, we're going to have to be able to move quickly to ensure that doesn't uh, be uh, a sort of an issue or um, be detrimental to our, our, our water bowl, our recently re released water bowls. And always continually commu commu continual community engagement, more people we can get involved, the better. Um, and I think really seeing water bowls as part of our community um, and just people being more empowered and engaged in their local environment, that can only be a good thing. And more volunteers we have, the more we can achieve. There is fundraising that we're trying to do. Uh, uh, as I say, water bowls aren't cheap, um, um, so we, we've got a lot targeted on that to try and to try and uh, make sure we've got the funds uh, when it is appropriate. What is quite interesting when you're doing a water bowl reintroduction, you have to put your order in about a year in advance because you don't want to release babies to the catchment. You have to release about one year olds. So um, we're, we're we're raising the money for that. And as I say, as I'm now the biodiversity. Manager uh, officer for Kingston Council. We're creating a biodiversity action plan, and within that, we'll fall a water bowl species action plan, which will integrate the amazing sort of community work that's taking place already. Um, yeah, but just a quick more around the fundraising element. We now have um, recruited uh, another intern called Rui, who's who, who's who's been who's fantastic. Um, she's actually based in Malaysia, even though she's studying at a London university. She's got stuck out there with the whole COVID situation, but she's helping us plan a community fundraiser, which is going to take place in about two and a half months. We're going to launch it and we're going to hopefully have lots of content, videos and competitions, all generated by our community volunteers, um, just to sort of help us raise uh, the target, uh, which will help us put our order in uh, for the water bowls. Um, so the reinstruction itself, you have to be very, very, very um, sensible and sort of we have to make sure everything's thought about when it comes to reintroducing anything. Um, and following what guidelines are available. So we would look at the, uh, the Water Bowl Management uh, Conservation Handbook, which has some really good information in it, which is all sort of based on the IUCN reinstruction guidelines. But the basic sort of uh, things to know when you're looking to re bring water bowls back, the minimum viable population for a water bowl is about 100. So you use 100, but that's at the peak breeding season. So that's sort of mid-summer when you've got your maximum bowls, not in the winter when some have, about, some have died off. So you're looking to have a, a, a best 100 um, and that and they, they require at least 1.5 kilometers of good habitat uh, that's all connected. Um, so they, what they state in the, in the reintroduction guidelines, uh, you should release no more, no fewer than 44 individuals along a 1.45 kilometer stretch of river. And when you release them, it's quite exciting. You can see in that picture, you have these little pens that you put the waterfalls in and they're acclimatized to the area and then uh, release themselves uh, and they leave when, it, when it's ready. 
of course, with any monitor uh, with the instruction program, it's good to have a monitoring scheme. So once we, we get these voles in the river, which hopefully won't be in the too far distant future, we'll then have our vole patrol, which will be water vole volunteers who are going out and we'll do like plop surveys. So we'll be able to listen to try and hear those plops as the water voles escape and also just trying to assess the habitat, the, the, the habitat and also the population. So what we're looking to do is release about 200 individuals, uh, 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 two individual water voles to about a four kilometer stretch of river and um, yeah, and we, we, that that is all very achievable in 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 the short term. And then you will have to reintroduce potentially more in the future to ensure genetic viability. But yeah, that, that's the basic premise of it. But I think what this project represents at its heart is almost the future of conservation, showing that any conservation program, if it's going to be successful, it has to be well integrated in the local community. And um, by having so many inspired local people to support the project, you can achieve so much more at scale. Um, so I really hope all conservation projects really think about how they mobilise and empower people to be a key part of the project. And that's something that has been a highlight of this project for myself, just to see so many great people, meet so many great people, all who want to bring water voles back with that shared vision. And also water voles are a great way of getting people into nature conservation because they are that charismatic sort of flagship species. So some suggested reading before I leave you guys, I will do some questions. Obviously the Waterfall Conservation Handbook is great for anybody who wants to get a, a serious uh, idea about water voles. And uh, NICE has got lovely, lovely pictures of this book called The Water Bowl, which has got some lovely images in it uh, by Christine Gregory, uh, which, yeah, so they're, they're, you, can, you can find them both online. Um, so thank you very much for listening. As I say, we have got these little face mask things. If anybody does want to be, a, we don't have to call it a face covering, not a face mask, but because it's, because it's made by our, our volunteers. My mum's made loads of them, which is great. Also, please do check out the Hogs Mill video that we've got on our YouTube channel, uh, which is hopefully the link has been shared. Um, and then if you want to email me about anything, that's my email address, Elliot uh, Newton at kingston.gov.uk. And you can follow me on Twitter at Elliot Newton 90. And I've started using Twitter recently, so I'm trying to actually be quite active on that. But yeah, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for the uh, Field Study Council guys for letting me have the opportunity to talk to you all. And um, yeah, that, mainly thank you to all the amazing community volunteers who have got us this far. And yeah, exciting times ahead. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Elliot. That was great. Um, yeah, so if any of you have any questions, please do raise your hands. We went through it earlier. Or post your questions in the chat and I'll try and work my way through them all now. I know there's been a lot going on in the chat during the talk, so sorry to those of you that find it quite annoying. I know it flashes up sometimes. Um, but, but before we we'll question, Tolly, can I get a quick idea of how many people put their hands up in terms of seeing water voles? Do we, do we, do we capture that? We can do that again. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so if everyone, <laughs> before asking questions, if we put our hands up now, if you've seen a water bowl, and I can let Elliot know how many of you there are. Wow, there's loads. Can you see all of those, Elliot? Uh, I can see 24, is that right? Yeah. Oh, look at that, that's good. Well, I hope you all agree that they're an absolute pleasure to see. <laughs> Great. Sorry, I was just looking. There was um, a question from Sarah. She was just asking, is the video available? Because she's turned up late. Yes, Sarah, we'll send her in the link to the recording afterwards. Um, we'll send that in a couple of days' time once that's up on there. Okay, we've got a question from Mia asking, um, can you tell us how to identify water voles from their burrows, tracks, poo or grazing? Um, cool, yeah, there's lots of sort of ways. Um, if you get a big population of water voles, uh, especially with breeding females, they'll create latrines. Um, so if you find latrines along the river with sort of droppings in, that's a really good sign. Um, they've got quite star-shaped uh, footprints, um, so they've got quite identifiable tracks. If you give it a Google, you'll see that it's quite splayed uh, digits, um, which again is quite distinguishable. Um, and then uh, in terms of the grazing, I'm not sure how reliable it is, but what they say, a water vole will graze uh, a sedge or something like that at a 45 degree angle. So if you find a bit of sedge, it's got a bite line out of it, that's about 45 degrees, that might be a good indication that you've got water voles on the river. But to my mind, the best way of doing it is just listening out to plops. And if you hear those plops, you almost certainly got water voles. Nice, thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Thomas, uh, just asking for advice. He wants to know if you've got any tips for how to set up community projects like this. Um, well, I think, as I said, I think one of the best things about the sort of the world at the moment 
the nature agenda is ever increasing in the sort of public mindset. There are lots of people out there who might be depressed when they're thinking about the bigger picture of environmental collapse and stuff. But so if you can give an opportunity for them, people to do something positive uh, environmentally in their local sphere of influence, um, you normally get quite a good response. Water bowls is quite a good way of um, engendering or capturing uh, imagination locally because they are that sort of charismatic flagship species. So people tend to, if I was trying to, so if I started with glow worms, I don't think we'd have had the same response. But who knows? You guys are better at vertebrates than I am. But <laughs> but but, um, uh, but yeah, I think being a charismatic mammal is a good way. But um, I think just 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 being um, open to listen to people in the community, just trying to give them those opportunities to engage. Um, and yeah, uh, you might be surprised about the response that you get. I think all animals are charismatic. It's how we sell them. So, <laughs> I mean, we, we have no problems making earthworms popular and exciting and sexy with the earthworm side. So I think you could have done just as well with glowworms. Glowworms are cool. Yeah, no, we are. We're about to do, we're about to do glowworms. So. They go in the dark. I mean, what more do you want from an animal? <laughs> Brilliant. Um, we've got Kate with her hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please, Kate? Are you there, Kate? Okay, I might move on. Maybe that's still a hand up from the waterfall question before. Um, so I'll clear that one for now and I'll go back to asking questions in the chat, but put your hand back up, Kate, if you do want to join in. Um, so we had a question from Jenny in the chat asking, are waterfalls affected by water quality? Yeah, good question. Um, uh, well, if you look at the evidence base, there's actually very little evidence around water quality and actually water bowl habitation. Um, if you sort of look at the decline that we've seen of water bowls in recent years, um, and then you say if you look at the Thames in the 50s, where it was a lot more polluted river, um, it was sort of deemed ecological dead in the 50s. Um, uh, we still have water bowls living in a very sort of polluted water environment then. Um, uh, so there's very little actual evidence linking decline. It was very difficult correlation and causation and all of that, but there's there's not much in the way of fundamentally linking the two together. But of course, any water bowl, if I was a water bowl, I'd want to live in clean water, not sewagey rubbish water. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, so a follow on from that, from Jenny's first question, she was asking, is the 2019 Twickenham sighting on the River Crane? And when are you hoping to be able to release the water bowls? Um, so I, I don't, I, there's, a, there's a fantastic group of volunteers along the crane, mainly you for an organisation called FORCE, uh, led by somebody called Rob Gray, and there's a guy called Ian McKennan who's like the waterfall expert in that area. So they're, they're probably better at talking about the waterfall sightings on that catchment. But, the, um, uh, but well, the plan with this project is to talk to all the other catchments that are local to us and sort of see if, they, if this community in methodology of surveying a river might be of interest to them. Um, uh, uh, and use that to engage with people. Um, in terms of our, um, uh, our release date, as soon as we can, we're sort of pinned, we were pinned down. Uh, ideally, our initial target was spring of 2021. I think that's going to be shifted now a bit, considering we've had lockdown and the various engineering works hasn't taken place. But um, we're going to try and get them as soon as we can. It's best to release in the spring. Again, it gives them the time to acclimatise to the river throughout the summer. And then when winter comes and you experience that big die after quite more of a resilient population. But we haven't got an actual defined date for release, but just as soon as we can, realistically. Yeah. That's great. Uh, we've got a couple of questions from well, Joe and Mike. They're sort of talking about human and dog presence. Um, if that affects them, will you have to ban dog walking near the river to keep the habitat in good condition? And then if you have to do that, how are you going to keep the community on side? Oh, fantastic question, right? So um, what we're lucky with our catchment, our initial release site is going to be in um, a sewage works, <laughs> which might not sound good, but there's some fantastic habitat in there and the water quality is not too bad most of the time. Uh, so uh, the sewage works, is, we've got about two kilometres of river there, which is completely not accessible to the public. So there's lots of habitat there in which they can have this um, area where they can be aware, uh, sort of aware or away from being disturbed by dogs because dogs indeed do have an issue with water voles, poaching the banks and stuff. They can cause stress 
and potentially predate the population. So what we're trying to do this to try and go hand in hand is an urban river. We're always going to have dog walkers along the river, which is absolutely fine. But we're going to try and encourage dog walkers to walk their dogs responsibly. And we're hoping if they're a dog walker who are like mammals and like animals, they might have some affinity towards a project to not want to cause damage um, to the water population in the main. I know there will always be exceptions. Um, but what we're going to try and do is set up dog splash zones areas along the river where the dogs can go in and enjoy the river and hopefully that will give areas uh, where the water bowls can set up in sort of relative peace. Well, oh, thank you. Sorry Stephen, I realised you posted a question earlier above where I was reading. Um, so it's one from Stephen, she's asking, how easy is it to distinguish water bowls from rats and other bowls? He's seen a couple of possible ones but not quite sure if it's another rodent or not. Mm. Um, so rats, have, if you just look at their sort of facial structures, water bowl is quite stubby. We've got not, not much that it, its snout isn't pronounced, whereas a rat have that sort of more triangular sort of facial bone structure. Um, rats can be quite a lot bigger than water bowls sometimes. Um, how they swim is, is different. Um, the tail is longer and slightly different. So there's lots of differences. The tracks are slightly different. It's hard to sort of explain that verbally, but if you look at them, um, but yeah. There are some key sort of physiological differences between the two um, and typically rats won't make a plop sound when they jump into the river, they're more slivering. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we had a question from Sam asking, do water bowls like uh, willows for sheltering in along the banks? Yeah, so especially in winter months when there's not much food availability in terms of vegetation, Bark is actually a good part of their diet and sort of winter berries. And willow, they will be they can nibble on the bark of willow, and uh, that that's and also can munch on the leaves. And as I said, they actually can be quite good climbers, so they might even be able to get into the sort of canopy. Um, so yeah, willow, especially yeah, is a good obviously it's a it's a typical species that you find along our watercourses. Um, but yeah, I think beavers probably prefer them to water voles, but water voles still like them. <laughs> Thank you. I've just um, someone messaged me in the chat saying Brian's got his hand up. I can't see it on my screen, unfortunately. But if you have a question, Brian, please unmute yourself and then. Ah, oh, there you are. Yes. Um, in our local streams, people have started to put this blue dye that fishermen have used in lakes uh, to suppress uh, vegetation. If this now gets into the streams where we might look to uh, release voles, is that going to be an issue? Has there been any research on this? Well, that's the first. I've sort of the most. Well, in terms of dye, the only sort of history that I've got of that is how Thames Water used to identify misconnections. So what they'll do, they'll put dye through the people's um, uh, various toilets or whatever and see if that then enters the water course. And that's meant to be pretty harmless. But this, I, I don't know, as a management regime, I've not actually come across that before. So um, I don't know. Uh, but I'll, yeah, I'll, send, I'll, send some I'll send you some details of it. I think it would be worth looking into a bit of research on that. Yeah, sounds scary. Thank you. Um, we had a question from Rebecca. Uh, she said, during lockdown, we've been fortunate to see waterfalls uh, in her local brook. Is there anything uh, they can do or should do to protect them? Um, she's concerned because there's planning nearby for a solar farm. Okay. Well, well one thing to remember, any wild water vole has legal protection underneath the Wildlife and Countryside Act. So if there is a the development nearby um, that could potentially impact the, the where they're living or their sort of you know the health of that population that per, that will have that was like a bat they'll have to the, that development will have to apply for a, a natural england permit to to do the works and put in water bomb mitigation so I, i'd make sure that you know oppose any development that isn't that it can be damaging <laughs> to the water bomb population i would say it, it, as a broad stroke um, but in terms of general things, just even just raising awareness of them and just saying how great it is to have these on the river. Um, if you are walking uh, dogs along the river, uh, if you know there are areas of water bowls, have them on lead around that and then try and find areas where you, you're not going to um, disturb the dogs or going to disturb them too much. Um, what, what water bowls don't like are really shady environments. They like sort of open rivers, which have lots of macrophytes, so lots of various vegetation types. So if they've got um, a nice sunny patch, that's really good. If you start getting like sort of self-sown sycamores all over the place, they're sort of shading the river, it'll be good to investigate if you could do some habitat management to ensure the river stays nice and open rather than getting too shaded. But yeah, that's... that's Elliot, off the back of that, I think one thing I'm wondering, what, 
what can people do to make sure that your project and, and other similar projects that, that might be in, in an area, what can they do to make sure when they've seen a water wall that you're aware of it? Uh, no, tell me. <laughs> Maybe tell Giggle. <laughs> tell Giggle is a good idea. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Uh, yeah, obviously, so Giggle, every, every area has, it has its record centre. Uh, so if you just record your, if you, um, yeah, report your sighting to local ecological record centres, uh, and then we can then access that data. As a council, we, we can see all the Giggle, all the Giggle data. So, um, yeah, tell, yeah, record the thing. What I should have said, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, there's an online recording form on the Giggle website and there'll be similar kinds of things for other record centres in other areas but as well as waterfall any, any wildlife you see we should be recording I just wanted to get that in. <laughs> um, we had a question from Ashleen asking have you used uh, camera traps and remote trap monitors if so how effective are they and have you had any issues with antisocial behaviour um, she's had a few rafts broken and stolen in the past, um, so that so she's been looking at placing them in more secluded areas. Yeah, absolutely. So that is especially because we're working in an urban environment. There's about 182,000 people that live in Kingston. Not many of them sort of walk along the river, I imagine, but a lot of them there's still a lot of footfall. So unfortunately, we ha our, our rafts have been subject to some um, vandalism. Uh, we've had to repair two of them yeah, but what we do with that we just try and find as you say the most <laughs> inaccessible yet safe to monitor for the volunteer side of things areas which reduces them be reduces them being found but every time I find like a bunch of kids or something running around it or, or like sort of looking almost suspicious around the rafts I'll always go up to them and tell them what they are and actually they, they tend to be quite excited about waterfalls and stuff so I think a lot of community engagement to sort of restrict that could be could be useful um, or was the other part of the question? Sorry, I've forgotten. There was uh, another, there was yeah, part. <laughs> yeah just, if you use them, um, how effective are they? And then have you had issues with them as well? Oh, 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 camera traps, right? Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so last year we had, no, two years ago, we had camera traps all along the, all along the river and we're doing lots of filming, mainly to make that little Hogsmill video that I hope you might go away and, and watch. So we had, and it picked up so much incredible behavior from kingfishers to all sorts of stuff. And it, it wasn't part of a technical survey for water bowls, but we had an intensive camera trapping effort. Um, on that survey, on that, we never, picked, we never captured mink on those um, traps, uh, on those camera traps, and we never obviously got any water bowls either, but we've got lots of other species. We are now considering with some of the mink rafts to try and set up a, a, a camera trap next door to the mink raft so we can help us identify the presence. We haven't done it yet, but it's something we're very quickly looking to, to do. And to try and combat the, the antisocial destruction vandalism side of things, we're going to try and put them in those sort of padlocked sort of metal box cages, which can protect them from being stolen or destroyed. But yeah, I think mink, mink rafts on their own, to my mind, need a bit of help from camera traps if we want to be absolutely sure that they're not there. Great, thank you. Lawrence, you've got your hand up. Do you want to ask your question? Hello, so thank you very much for a very um, interesting talk, by the way. Um, I was going to ask, you mentioned, and this is sort of straying a little bit from waterfalls, but you mentioned at the beginning uh, a rewilding ethos. I just wondered what your sort of wider uh, plans or dreams or aspirations are for the Hogsmill and, and the borough in general. Yeah, so I think the thing with rewilding, it means a lot of people, a lot of things to a lot of different people. Obviously, we're working quite an urban context here. But when I, when I think of the words rewilding, there's two sort of elements to it. Obviously, we haven't, got, we haven't got much of a farming community around here. So the implications there aren't as prolific as there might be in more sort of rural environments. But um, to me, uh, rewilding, we're rewilding people. So we're trying to reconnect people to the natural world and using water bowls to do that. So we're getting a reset reconnection to nature and then rewilding our landscapes where we can. So I'm really a believer in sort of uh, ecological processes and where possible trying to have these sort of functional ecosystems that can support as many ecosystem services and as much rich biodiversity as possible. So we're just trying to 
we're trying to engage with the uh, new Natural England Nature Recovery Networks thing, which never actually mentioned rewilding, but they do say embracing natural dynamism and ecological dynamism, which in my mind is the sort of similar, similar sort of ethos. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just sort of avoiding the sort of potential term that, uh, you know, can can be quite damaging but uh if i was if i if i if i had millions millions of pounds to do lots of stuff and loads of loads of time loads of to do stuff i would love to do all sorts of things um in the urban environment we've got a big nature reserve in um kingston which is about 50 uh, square kilometers uh, 50 square hectares or 50 hectares even um i think you could learn a lot what they've done at nep with that big there and that's right it's right on the the boundary of the hogs mill so it could be introduced some naturalistic grazing there which sort of emulates the nep approach in an urban environment could we even on some of our nature reserves consider beaver trials especially in outer london where we're trying to restore water and reduce in the london flooding can we use these nature-based solutions so we're, who, who knows could, could we could we in the long term could we investigate um even having those sort of nature-based solutions to climate change in the urban environment. I think in a lot of cases you probably can, it's just being a bit more adventurous. Oh, thank you. Uh, you just mentioned beavers, we've had a question about that from Liz. Um, she was asking, uh, in the beaver introduction trial sites um, in Cornwall, are there any known effects on the waterfowl populations? Do they help them? Or Oh, well, I, 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 to be honest, I think the best people to talk to there are the Cornwall Wildlife Trust and um, Exeter University, I think. There's a chap called Mark Elliott, I believe, who sort of runs that project. I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, I, in terms of the details on the project, I couldn't tell you. But what I can tell you, having beavers in the landscape creates an explosion of life from, and I'm sure there'll be, well, there's obviously benefits to amphibians and invertebrates like dragonflies and water quality. Um, I'm sure they would live in a symbiotic relationship with water voles, but I'm not entirely sure what that relationship would look like. But um, I don't know. <laughs> well, so would they maybe create more water vole friendly habitat though? Oh, yeah, absolutely they would. Like, so by flooding areas, they would create more potential habitat. And there's, especially as they across Europe, where you have these wet meadows, where you have these morphosaurial populations, and they actually don't make burrows, and in some cases they also make nests and stuff above the waterline. So yeah, you, they could potentially create habitat for water voles. So yeah, that'd be cool. Okay, I'm gonna squeeze in one last question so I can see Nigel's got his hand up. Do you wanna ask your question, Nigel? Yes, thank you. Um, I was, I, was I, 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 I perhaps missed something right at the start, but I was just keen to understand whether there is a pre-existing population of water vole in the hogs mill. Um, and if there is, if you've been carrying out sign surveys, or as far as you know, is it completely devoid of a population? Um, yeah, so I, I can if I try and go back to the map. Oh, well, I'll, we've got we've been working with Giggle on getting all the record data from them. Uh, 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 but if we go back 30 years, there was a very very strong population of water voles in the river. The last recorded sighting we believe to be in 2014. Um, so there is quite a recent population. What we can tell is they're functionally extinct. Um, with all our sort of survey effort, there's been no real um, obvious mink, uh, mink water bowl sightings, especially to, if, if you imagine that a viable population is about 100 individuals in the summer, you, you, you'd be, it'd be obvious if you had a, pop, a healthy population on the river. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a strong ecological history of voles on the river. Um, ecologically and also culturally as well so yeah I think that does set a precedent for their reintroduction it's not like we're reintroducing them to their non-former range. Sure. Brilliant thank you very much I know there's a few more questions in the chat we have run out of time now I'm afraid so I'll have a look through those and send them to Elliot later and we can try and um, send send some of the answers out in the follow-up email uh, so thank you Elliot for taking the time to talk to us today really good talk Lot Nice to see um, lots of people love waterfalls on here, obviously. And thank you for everyone for joining us today. I know it's very hot and you probably all sat there melting. But um, we'll finish now so you can go outside and get some fresh air. And hopefully we'll see you all soon. So, yeah, thank you and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much indeed. Bye. 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 Thank you.